Uh, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, seeing dollar signs one last time. It's been the series we've been working through all through November, and uh, talking about what is the intersection between faith and our finances. What does God have to say about the way we use our resources, and uh, what is God calling us to be, and how is God calling us to live in relationship to money? Um, and so, um, there's this really tricky verse in the Bible passage that uh, Megan just read. A uh, more traditional translation uh, says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And I guess broadly, it's pretty clear what Jesus is driving at here. Um, Jesus is giving us some advice about not hoarding money, about not getting too hung up on the things of this world because... You know, there's another life coming. And even still, I've always had trouble understanding exactly what Jesus is getting at with the idea of storing up treasures in heaven. Just think about that image for a minute. First of all, what is the currency of heaven? Like, is this about money specifically? Like giving generously to the poor and to share with God's people through the church? Or... Are like good deeds the currency of heaven? When we pay it forward with acts of kindness in this life, are we making a deposit in some bank account in heaven as well? And also, like, what's the exchange rate? Right? This is a big deal. Bankers in the crowd, you get this. Does one good deed get me five extra golden crowns? Or if I start a church, do I get a window suite in my heavenly mansion? How does this work? And perhaps the most puzzling aspect for me of all of this uh, is the fact that somehow, when we get to heaven, the playing field won't be even. Is kind of what this sounds like on, it, on its surface. Even in heaven, some will be rich with their heavenly treasures, and some will be poor. And some will have stockpiles of heavenly wealth, and some will be in subsidized housing. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, it's still heaven, so you, you can't go wrong, but can you see how this notion of storing up treasures in heaven gets a little weird when you really think about it? So that's why this whole section seems like it's worth uh, picking through to find the heart of what Jesus is getting at today. What are treasures in heaven, and why do we care? So let's look back a few verses from that particular phrase. And, uh, and see how Jesus gets us into this story. So here's the paragraph leading into our, our question for today. Uh, Jesus says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Well, that clears things up, I guess. Um, so Jesus is talking to the religious people in the audience at this point. So he's talking to a large crowd. This is the Sermon on the Mount. People are gathered around. Jesus has sought higher ground so that everyone can hear him and see him. And, uh, and Jesus is talking specifically to you super churchy people among us today. See, in many, uh, in many religions throughout history, it's been a common practice um, to practice self-denial and to even inflict pain on yourself in order to curry favor with God. And in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, the most religious men of Jesus', Jesus religion, Judaism, would often go without food twice a week. <coughs> They'd fast twice a week, even though their own religion only asks for it six times a year. And when they fasted, you better believe they let everyone know about it. They didn't wash. They went barefoot. They covered their heads in ashes. They're moaning as they walk down the street. I'm fasting. I'm fasting. Everybody, look how religious I am. Look how spiritual I am. Look at how much I'm putting myself through. God must love me extra. And Jesus says, no. 
If you're going to do something for God, do it for God's sake. Not to get others recognition for how holy you are. And I think that thought helps us to look inside this idea of treasures in heaven a little bit. Um, even if you're doing something religious, if you get credit for it here on earth, then you've received your payment already in full. But if it's between you and God, then it counts. <laughs> and Jesus says that God will reward you. So Jesus does not go on to explain what that reward will look like. I think the, the practice of keeping your religious accomplishments a secret, whether you're the kind of person who fasts regularly or prays every day for an hour or who gives half their income to the poor, I think the real benefit of serving and loving God in private is that you become the kind of person who serves and loves God for God's own sake. You become the kind of person that God needs more of in this world. And I think that's at least part of what Jesus is getting at here in this message about treasures in heaven. And I think just one life lesson to take home from this is to beware of people who want credit for their generosity. When someone donates a million dollars to a university for a new research building, nine out of ten times, they're going to want their name on that building, right? Is it good for the college that they gave? Sure. Does that make the donor a truly generous person? Tough to say. But I know for sure that God wants us to find joy in the act of giving. God wants us to find joy simply in the act of giving. God wants us to be generous from the core of who we are because when we discover that, when we discover that part of our humanity, we actually become more like Christ, who was generous enough to give up his very life for us. But Jesus doesn't end here. He continues on with these words. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So Jesus makes this really sharp turn in his message, in where he's pointing his message amongst this big audience that's gathered to hear him speak. He was going off on the religious people and then BAM! He's looking at Richie Rich sitting in the back row. And Jesus says, don't store up your treasures on earth. Why? Because stuff happens. The rich landowner has insects eat his crop. The wealthy merchant gets his fine fabrics eaten by moths. Over time, even your gold will tarnish and lose its luster. Uh, so I was cleaning my garage this week. Okay, so I wasn't cleaning it. Um, I couldn't find something, and in the act of... That's not our garage. That's not, that's not our garage. <laughs> so I, I was looking for something, and in the act of searching, a thing that resembled organization took place around me. And in my cleaning, I discovered that a mouse had found his way into my garage, and he had hit pay dirt. He found the mother load, and I'm guessing this little guy spent the better part of a night gorging himself on something that I had been stockpiling. Mouse poison. <laughs> and that's the reality of placing too much value on our things and hoarding them for ourselves. We're poisoning our souls, and we don't even know it. We're feasting on the things of this world and dying inside. And the same decay that falls upon our crops and our clothes and that little mouse in my garage will come to visit all of us one day. And on that day, we'll discover just how hollow our investments in this world were. And that actually brings us to the alternative that Jesus presents. Jesus' big answer to the problem of religious pride on the one hand and materialism on the other. Jesus says, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think now we can see a little more clearly where Jesus is going with this than we could a little while ago. See, God is not especially concerned about giving us a reward for being, uh, about giving us a reward for being faithful. God wants us to see faithfulness as its own reward. Just like we start off trying to get our kids to clean their room and we give them a reward for doing that in the hopes that they will develop a value within themselves that having a clean room is a good thing. It didn't work on me. Um, but you know, for some it might. Jesus wants us to hold on to this world loosely. Not with a white-knuckled death grip. This whole thing about treasures in heaven isn't about God keeping score between the good Christians and the really good Christians. It's about living a kingdom of heaven kind of life before you ever cross through those pearly gates. It's about having your values squared away, understanding what's really important. Jesus is trying to get us to understand one simple idea that's actually really, really hard to live out. Here it is. You store up treasures in heaven by living like heaven is your treasure. You store up treasures in heaven by living like heaven is your treasure. Jesus says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Jesus says that our heart actually follows the things we invest in financially. And you've seen this play out in your own life, haven't you? When you first bought that new grill, <laughs> you were out there cleaning it when it wasn't dirty. And you got all the accessories and the doodads and, you know, whatever, like, ironic apron that you needed to have. You invested in it, and so you paid more attention to the thing that you burn meat with than you did to your wife and your kids for a few weeks. This is a thing that happens all the time. So please believe me when I tell you that if you want to be the kind of person who cares for the poor instead of a grill, then you put your money where your mouth is. If you want to be the kind of person who cares about the environment, you put your money where your mouth is. If you want to be the kind of person who experiences God in real ways on a regular basis and wants other people in this community to discover what God is up to here at Northern Light Church, I invite you to put your money where your mouth is. Because when you put your money where your mouth is, you'll find that your heart is following close behind. So we just finished celebrating Thanksgiving. Jenny and I shared the cooking duties evenly this year. Um, she cooked the turkey, and I opened the can of cranberry sauce. <laughs> With that, that aesthetically pleasing slurp that it comes out. Um, on Thanksgiving, it's really common uh, as families and extended families to, to come together and look around you and thank God for all the things you can see that you're grateful for. All this food, a home, a family that loves us. But the reality that Jesus reveals to us is that these things actually aren't the most valuable things that we can have. Uh, someone from church, uh, she, actually Anna, you just met her. <laughs> she, she, she shared this song on Facebook this past week, and uh, I had never heard it before, uh, mostly because... I don't listen to country music. Um, well, I don't listen to country music after like 1977. That's, anyway, but, um, but I want to share, I, I would like to share this song with you. I actually learned it, and I want to share it with you now because I think it really gets at the heart of what we've been talking about today. So, um, so here we are. It's going to take a little adjustment here. Got this. Trying to not knock anything over. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> oh, 
what I'm thankful for in our no list. For it only in my heart exists. For time has helped me understand the things I can't hold in my hand. For those who came before my turn, from whom I've gathered lessons learned, the light, the path that lies ahead. I see them as I bow my head. Yes, I'm thankful for the Lord above, the gift of His unending love, the promise kept that there is something more. These are the things I'm thankful for. For our children, hear this prayer. Let love surround them everywhere. And may their children's children know the one from whom all blessings flow. And amidst these gifts and presents, we receive this holiday. May we ask a thoughtful second just to fold our hands and pray. Yes, I'm thankful for the Lord above, the gift of His unending love, the promise kept that there is something more. These are the things I'm thankful for. so simple. It's so simple you can fit it in a country song, right? <laughs> it's almost sappy. And yet, it's the challenge we spend our whole lives learning to accept. That is, as people of faith, our most treasured possession can't be kept in a vault. Our greatest treasure is actually in our own hands right now. What will you choose to do with your days and with your nights? Where will you invest your love, your heart, your life, and even, even your wealth? Our greatest treasure is the reward of becoming the kind of people who give others a taste of heaven right here and right now. Pray with me. God, we thank you for the chance to be yours. We thank you for your unending love and that by that love alive in our lives, we can see so much more clearly at what you are creating us to be. We are more than just consumers. We are more than just employees or breadwinners. We are your treasure. And so help us to live like heaven is our treasure. And help us to invest our lives in the good things that you are up to in this world so that we can experience that joy, not just someday, but right now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.